Uh, we're going to move on to um, look at a, a different uh, sort of um, policy area, but also one that uh, does um, connect with our previous conversation around some of these environmental sustainability issues, looking at uh, notions of health and well-being and the, uh, the health impacts of housing. Uh, and our third paper is from uh, Associate Professor Susan Thompson. Uh, Susan has worked as a planner in Australia for over 30 years and uh, she joined the University of New South Wales in 1991 after holding positions in both state and local government, uh, encompassing both strategic and statutory planning. Um, Susan has a wide and cross-disciplinary uh, research interests, including uh, healthy planning, encompassing community gardens, edible verges and intersectoral ways of working to promote healthy cities and communities, uh, cultural diversity in urban planning, and also the meanings of home. So uh, please make Susan very welcome. Thank you very much. Sorry, I'll just set things up here a bit. Well, I would also like to acknowledge the Indigenous owners of the land on which we meet and um, also to say that this work that I'm talking about today has been done with my colleague, uh, Professor Peter Phibbs from the University of Western Sydney. In the talk, I want to just very briefly outline some of the major issues around housing and health, simply to sort of start talking about, well, what is healthy housing? And many of those issues I'm sure that you are quite well across. I'm going to point out some perhaps more em emerging issues, um, a couple of major issues there, and we'll, we'll hopefully that will open some ideas that we might well want to talk about in the Q&A session. I'm going to talk briefly about some major Aus Australasian research on housing and health, and then conclude by discussing some issues around what sort of research should we be doing at the policy research interface, if you like. So engaging built environment and health professionals across those two disciplines in collaborative partnerships. So when we, when we think about health and the built environment, which is principally my concern, what, what sort of issues come to mind? And this diagram um, may be well known to those of us who come from health side, but not so much from the built environment side. It's sometimes called, as I've called it here, the social determinants of health, sometimes, and perhaps more correctly, determinants of health. But this diagram and various iterations of it simply shows us very co uh, cogently that our health is affected much more than just our, our own individual personal factors. So at the centre, our age, our sex and the genetic inheritance that we have. Of course, those things affect our health, but so too do, does the way that we live our lives, our day-to-day -day life, our social and community networks, and then our, our living and working conditions. And you can see on the diagram different aspects of those, of those conditions. And I've put a big red star around housing. Housing is very much part of the social determinants of health. So in simple terms, what is healthy housing at, at a broad level when we think about what possibly should be included as, a, as, a con as constituting healthy housing, what are the sort of things that we, we need to, to think about? Well, first, first of all, is housing affordable? Secondly, is it, is it secure? Um, is it secure in terms of tenure so that we're not worried that we're going to be thrown out of where, where we live? Is it a safe place to be? And that's safe in terms of, I suppose, well, both internal and, and out, outer environments. Um, then we get 
thinking about issues to do with um, domestic violence as well as intruders that might impinge from the outside onto a house as well as broader environmental issues in relation to safety. In relation to the dwelling itself, is it in good physical condition so that it's not drafty, cold, um, excessively hot in summer, it doesn't have hazardous design um, or fittings that are going to cause accidents, um, any danger to ourselves or um, particularly to children and older people. Then a little more broadly, how is it located in relation to giving us access to labour markets, to where we might work? And remembering back to the determinants of health diagram, our working environment, our access to work and therefore income is very, very critical to our health. How does housing also relate to access um, to goods and different services that also impinge on people's health. And with, within um, the broader um, uh, dwelling setting, how supportive is um, that house of, our, uh, uh, of us being healthy? And I'll talk more broadly about that in a moment. In, in terms of particular factors that we might consider in relation to to the dwelling and um, disease burden, particular aspects of the dwelling that might cause particular health problems. So the, I've just listed some of the, the most common here. Physical factors, heat, cold, uh, temperature variations, noise pollution is very important, ventilation, um, again, for temperature control. Then there are issues to do with chemical factors, um, often um, things that we can tr control ourselves in relation to tobacco smoking, but then in relation to lead, often associated with lead paint in old buildings, and that can be particularly problematic when people start to renovate, um, pull pull down buildings and then of course there's issues to do with um, asbestos and other building materials that may have serious, serious implications for our health. Biological factors relate to things like humidity, mould, dust, mite, mites and pests and I've put a, little, a few pests down there for you to um, consider how they might uh, impinge on the health of your housing um, and not only the physical health but of course the um, stress and the concern that people have great phobias about some of these uh, little creepy crawly insects but I mean very seriously they um, can cause 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 many problems in relation to how our houses uh, protect our health. Building factors, we need to consider those in relation to accidents, sanitation, um, hygiene, to ensure that all the f facilities, the services coming into a dwelling and the waste management services from the dwelling are well connected, are working correctly to ensure that our day-to-day -day living within the house um, is, is healthy. And then more, um, more to the social, psychological factors in relation to what constitutes a healthy house. Is it free from, cr from crime? How does it make us feel um, socially included rather than socially excluded? And uh, issues to do with crowding. So those are some of the most important factors in relation to the individual dwelling and how it might affect our house, uh, our, sorry, our health, individual dwelling and health. In terms, and, and in terms of the literature, they're well documented in, in the literature. But if we go a little bit broader and start to think about some emerging concerns that I think are very important to think about in relation to housing and health, 
The, the role of the dwelling location has serious implications for health and these sorts of implications are being much better researched and understood in, I suppose, the area that we might term more generally um, healthy planning or healthy built environments. Things like how well is the dwelling positioned, how well is it located in relation to transport options? Are there options for the people living in that particular dwelling to get onto public transport or is is there simply no other option than to get into the car? And we increasingly know that having total car dependency is very, very detrimental to our physical and our mental health. And I'm more than happy to talk um, about that a little later. Um, in terms of the neighbourhood, safety, um, this also goes to traffic uh, relating to car dependency, but certainly about crime, not only the actuality of crimes occurring in a neighbourhood, but the perceptions that people might have as to whether it's a safe place to live or not. And that in turn relates to how, f how well people feel that they're able to be part of a community, not to feel isolated from a community. If, a com if, if people don't feel safe in their own community, then they don't feel a part of that community and that has, again, detrimental effects on health. Um, and that's the point about social interaction. Does the dwelling in its location support people being physically active? Are there places to walk to, to cycle to? Is there infrastructure to support that sort of physical activity? Is, um, do, do we have open spaces, recreational areas provided that also enable us to be physically active? So it's to do with both incidental um, activity that we, we do as part of everyday living, but also purposeful recreational activity. Air and water pollution, very obviously part of the, the environment where the house is located, very much to do with, with health. And my final point here, access to fresh and nutritious food. And that perhaps speaks to some of my um, interests that Ian mentioned in the um, introduction, community gardens, edible uh, nature strips, um, indeed edible local landscapes. Are there opportunities for people to engage in that sort of activity, which has multiple health benefits around physical activity and also social interaction, and it can also break down many cultural ba um, boundaries be between people. But access to fresh and nutritious food also goes to the availability of fresh foods in different stores, to the um, density of fast food outlets, to food advertising, and how that is co-located in um, areas around schools. So you can see it's important to think about the dwelling, not only in isolation, but very much in relation to its location in the neighbourhood and how that that is supportive or not supportive of people being health as part, healthy as part of their everyday living. Another emerging concern is to do with climate change. And here I've just noted a few implications of climate change for housing and health. There will inevitably be increased public health risks in, in indoor environments, particularly in relation to higher temperatures and how we, how we manage those higher temperatures. More and more use of air conditioners obviously has adverse implications for greenhouse gas emissions and then that in turn exacerbates climate change, which is going to be bad for our health. Increases in moisture is going to increase mould and we already know that mould is adverse, um, adverse to our health when we're living in mouldy conditions. And the final point, and perhaps um, this is certainly something that you, those of you who are based here in, in Brisbane, will know um, more and more about the the um, damage, structural damage to to buildings in relation to flooding events, and 
how we have how we need to manage that and also the issues to do with increased pest inf infestations due to increases in moisture and um, and flooding so that sort of perhaps just broadly sketches out some of the issues to do with with health and housing now I'm just going to move to talk a little bit about the, the panel that um, Peter Phibbs and I organised. It was very much motivated around our belief and our understanding from the research that housing and health is an interdisciplinary um, issue. There, it's, it, is a co it is about complex relationships between housing and health. And in order to address the sorts of issues that we need to be um, across, we have to engage researchers and policy makers and practitioners from both the public health areas, the housing areas and urban planning and, and more broadly built environment design. So in a sense those that was sort of the motivations and we brought together this panel um, they're the three key aims, if you, if you like, from our panel, um, not only to try and identify some gaps in policy relevant research, but to bring people together, to get them to start to think about the importance of engaging with each other, particularly across policy makers, researchers, practitioners, in those, those, those broad built environment and health um, areas. And I think we have to do this more and more across all of the areas that we're working in. And I'm looking forward to Ahuri sponsoring many more interdisciplinary engagements and research projects because this is a space where, um, and indeed I've, I've received criticism around my work in interdisciplinary areas, it is something that we have to work, work on and um, making absolutely mainstream in the sort of research that we do if it is going to be relevant in the contemporary world. Very briefly, some of the research that we brought to the attention of the panel and discussed during the panel, um, and I'm just going to focus now on some Australasian research that we that we um, discussed. This one was a, an early Australian study, um, f fairly standard sorts of um, issues came out in that study, and you can read more about it in our our report. Um, so. I won't go through that in detail. Um, the next study um, that I just want to mention, um, a longest, longitudinal study of households entering public housing. And this is interesting for some of the perhaps unexpected improvements in um, people's health as they entered public housing. One of um, the um, perhaps more surprising one was around increased self-esteem. And this came about through people being able to finally live independently because they weren't concerned about financing their housing. And as a result, they were able to look after themselves um, better and their health improved. And another interesting finding I think here was their improved ability to engage in physical activity due to increased financial resources. So um, again, I think this also speaks to the complex nature of health and housing and it's, it's very interdis interdisciplinary nature as well that we don't, um, that we, we mustn't underestimate the different and broad ranging impacts on health of good, uh, affordable and secure housing. More broadly, we went um, in terms of well, Australasian to some very important research from New Zealand. And this is from Philippa Howden Chapman and her team. And they've done some very interesting and quite, a la quite large studies uh, work on improving insulation, um, particularly in colder climates in, in New Zealand situation. And the research um, 
found improvements in health and well-being in relation to quite a lot of um, uh, factors, but including less days off school and work and reduced visits to GPs. And that work is very important in showing the financial benefits of putting in an intervention such as insulation, which has direct health benefits, which then has direct economic benefits to both um, productivity and to the, the health budget, reducing costs in the health budget. And I mean, that's an enormous issue that a lot of this re research needs to, um, needs to focus on. Um, the uh, last piece of Australian, no, sorry, the second last piece of Australasian research I want to mention briefly is some work by Adrian Franklin um, and colleagues in Tasmania on loneliness and um, loneliness in, re in relation to housing and its implications for health. We talk about this work in, in the report and I think perhaps I'll just point out the last point here um, um, in relation to some of the adverse health impacts related to loneliness that uh, um, Franklin um, states that loneliness is actually more dangerous than smoking to people's health. Now, we could you know, debate debate that, um, but I think it's just well, it's an interesting assertion that he makes, and um, one that clearly r requires further research. Uh, the final area that we looked at in relation to housing health in an Australasian context was work on Indigenous uh, communities and some housing health interventions in those communities. And, um, oh, actually, the images I had on this slide have um, have been deleted, but never mind. Um, the, the, the work is called Housing for Health, and it has been spearheaded by Paul Faleros, who gave a very um, a, a very good presentation at the um, at our panel, and his presentation is actually available from the Healthy Built Environments Program website. So if you want to have a look at that presentation, you can. But what this program does, it focuses on a um, survey and fix methodology, which simply looks at the safety of the dwelling and healthy living practices and how in looking at the, there's those, those lists of things there, washing people, washing clothes, um, right down to reducing trauma from accidents in, in the home, those, um, those 10 um, safety practices um, and hygiene practices that are related to different infrastructure, different services, facilities in the house, through paying attention to those, the interventions result in significant improvements to health. And this graph just sort of shows what those improvements um, or, or the sort of the, the extent to those improvements from an interventionary group and a non-intervention group around um, improvements in respiratory conditions, skin conditions, um, middle ear infections and intestinal infections. The middle ear, which is the last one, the Otis Media um, infection, was the, the, the least... Um, effective intervention, if you like. There was uh, not such a, um, su such a large improvement. However, there was still a slight improvement and overall uh, a major improvement. So what, what sort of um, things can we now t talk about, I suppose, in relation to the, the research and the policy interface around housing and health from this, this, uh, this work? Well, as I said, it's a complex relationship between these two um, variables. 
and in order to understand the complexities of that, we have to engage the built environment and health disciplines. We have to get communication happening between researchers and policy makers. Easy to say, not always easy to do. Um, and I think that learning from each other is very, very critical. And that was something that we really wanted to bring out in our panel through different information dissemination, as well as just um, people talking from their different perspectives. And, and that um, certainly did happen and I think provides a template for other similar coming comings together, meetings, networking, um, forums, symposia, where we bring policymakers, researchers together around health and housing. Um, we. Well, obviously, um, and we do do this in in the report. We um, we we looked at different p potentials for research, particular gaps in in the research, um, and some of the policies that I'm oh, sorry, some of the principles that we need to perhaps take on in thinking about well, what are some of the gaps in the research? Um, one important issue that came up was the. Um, the, the need for effective research on different interventions, housing interventions, and thinking, say, about the survey and fix methodology of the Indigenous housing interventions, that research needs to measure the, the cost effectiveness of such interventions, as well as the, the social effectiveness and the broader um, range of, it, of, of effectiveness. So that's a very clear example of how researchers and policymakers need to come together. The, um, another principle was looking at how can we uh, or how can researchers better look at, examine um, the effectiveness of different interventions. So if an intervention is going to go, uh, go ahead, it's important that practitioners are engaging with researchers to let them know that a particular intervention is going to occur and then the possibility then then is for the researchers to come in and to start to monitor that intervention. So you can have the, the pre and post monitoring of such an intervention. But if we're not talking to each other to know when these interventions are happening, a lot of really great research opportunities will be missed. Uh, now, my final um, point and my final slide is really around some issues to do with policy relevant research projects. First, I think we have to add better housing variables to longitudinal studies. A lot of these longitudinal studies are in health. There's um, the 45 and up study. There's the National Hilda study that some of you might, may be aware of. Those sorts of studies have very, very large um, uh, budgets. And again, this means we, we, as built environment researchers, need to be talking much more to health researchers so that we can perhaps piggyback, work together more collaboratively to make better use of such longitudinal studies, getting in questions in those longitudinal studies that speak to both built environment slash housing issues and as well as the health issues that are already embedded in such longitudinal studies. We have to be very, um, very, we, we have to improve the way that we articulate the likely dollar savings in health budgets from changes in housing. One such one, I think, is the insulation issue, and that's certainly been done in, in New Zealand. Unfortunately, we've had um, a rather, um, well, uh, uh, <laughs> you see some people smiling. Um, we had a lot of discussion about what happened in relation to the insulation program here in Australia. And and um, what, what started as a very well-targeted project um, or program, a, a, um, a program that was very much focused on good environmental outcomes that would have um, had good health outcomes 
obviously got derailed in the difficulties around the implementation of that program. But I think that's something that maybe when the dust settles, we can explore that insulation um, more broadly in relation to its health impacts and the consequent um, savings in budgets. Uh, multidisciplinary approaches need to be much more what we do as standard research studies and crossing, as I've said, the public health and housing um, in, in, uh, divide of those two areas. And my final point is the value of the investigative panel, um, while you, know, you might not launch into a full investigative panel. Um, I think it's great that Uhuri has now got this sort of um, way of doing research, but I think it also offers a template, a, a methodology for, for bringing people together to engage in interdisciplinary work and particularly in this, um, in this policy research interface of housing and health. Thank you.